Hello, everyone. I am Shritika Yola. I want to thank you all today for joining our member webinar, Pre-Implantation Genetic Testing for the Genetic Counselor Outline. We encourage questions to be asked throughout the presentation. As a courtesy to our presenters, all attendees have been muted. Please utilize the Zoom Q&A box for your questions you may have throughout the presentation. The chat function is also available for discussion throughout the talk. Questions will be read out loud during the last 10 minutes of the webinar. Today's learning objectives are, summarize the methodology of PGTM, examine challenging indications for PGTM using case examples, identify how genetic counselors may assist patients pursuing PGTM. I would now like to introduce Mira Fergosh, a laboratory genetic counselor at Cooper Genomics, to introduce our speaker, Sheila Johal. Thank you, Shritika. And thanks again to everyone for attending. I'm here primarily to introduce our speaker and to help field any questions at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, let me introduce Sheila Johal. Sheila is a manager of laboratory genetic counseling at Cooper Genomics. In addition to managing the primary PGTM team, she provides genetic counseling to patients seeking pre-implantation genetic testing. She came to Cooper Genomics after more than nine years at Metro Health Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio, where she provided prenatal, general, and cardiovascular genetic counseling. Sheila graduated with a master's degree in medical and molecular genetics with a focus in genetic counseling from Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis in 2006. Prior to attending graduate school, she also received a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Kent State University. She has specific interest in disorders of hemoglobin, CFTR-related infertility, and is passionate about educating genetic counseling students. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Mira. Can you just confirm that you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, welcome everybody and uh, thank you again for inviting me to speak. I was truly flattered to get the invitation um, and I'm always happy to talk about a topic that's really important and near and dear to my heart. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about pre-implantation genetic testing for monogenic disorders. Uh, what I would have probably liked to have called this talk um, is actually what I wish I had known when I was in clinical practice, uh, but I, I, I didn't think that would go quite so well over uh, when submitting to the webinar committee. So uh, starting with just a disclosure, I am a full-time paid employee of Cooper Genomics. We are a pre-implantation genetic testing laboratory. I will not be talking specifically about any Cooper products today though. Uh, Shrutika already went through my objectives, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here uh, just to remind everybody that we're going to be talking about how PGTM is done, and then we're going to use case examples to walk through um, some indications and to talk about how genetic counselors might help uh, patients who are seeking PGTM services. So I think it's always best to start at the beginning. And uh, whenever I'm putting a talk together like this, I'm always reminded um, that I have been out of school for a very long time. <clears throat> and I'm probably not the only one on this webinar who's been out of school for a very long time. And I think it's important to understand that in the field of pre-implantation genetic testing, the terminology has evolved as it has in almost every other area of genetics. So just so that everybody's on the same page about the current terms that are utilized, um, there are several different types of PGT or pre-implantation genetic testing. Uh, probably the most commonly ordered PGT test is for aneuploidy evaluation. And when I was in school, um, the acronym that was used for that was PGS or pre-implantation genetic screening but that has since been updated um, and is now referred to as PGTA or pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. For um, those who might be familiar with pre-implantation genetic testing for structural rearrangements, um, previously the terms PGD and PGS were really used interchangeably for that. 
um, but this terminology has also been updated and now this is pre-implantation genetic testing for structural rearrangements. So this is specifically chromosome screening for embryos that are conceived where one or both gamete contributors have some sort of structural rearrangement. And I'm just going to say here that these two PGT technologies, while very important, are not the focus of the talk today. These could probably both be their own webinars. So um, maybe the committee can take that under advisement for other dates. What we are going to focus on um, is pre-implantation genetic testing for monogenic or single gene disorders. Um, and the previous terminology for that is, is PGD. So um, as we talk for the rest of the 40-ish minutes that we have together, uh, you're going to hear me say PGTM, and, and this is what we're referring to. So I'm going to start um, by sharing with everybody a question that comes um, to myself, to my team, uh, usually multiple times a day, but certainly multiple times a week. And this question comes from really every facet. Um, it comes from patients, it comes from genetic counselors, it comes from IVF clinics, it comes from other physicians. Uh, and the question always is, can you do PGTM4? Fill in the name of your condition. BRCA1, uh, neurofibromatosis, cystic fibrosis, fragile X syndrome. And while I understand why this question is asked, uh, I really hope that as we talk through some of this information today, that you will start to understand why it's really important to reframe that question and start to ask it in a little bit of a different way. And the reason for that is because um, I think a secret that maybe is too well kept um, is that PGTM testing is not done by direct mutation analysis only. Um, it is actually done via linkage analysis. And this testing modality means that while we can do PGTM or while PGTM is available for almost any gene or any disorder, it is not available for every family. Um, there are certain parameters that have to be met in order for test development to be feasible. And we're gonna talk through that as we go through these slides. But I would invite you that the next time you're working with a family who is interested in PGTM, um, whether that's just peripherally or someone who is really ready to start pursuing this avenue, it is to ask a different question. And rather than to send a message to say, can you do PGTM for, again, fill in your disorder, the question should be, can you do PGTM for this disorder for this family? So starting a little bit with why we use linkage. So at the end of the day, um, it really comes down to the fact that we've got a very small amount of DNA that the laboratory is working with for PGT. Um, as a reminder, uh, PGT is typically completed um, on trophectoderm biopsy. So that's biopsy that happens at the blastocyst stage. Um, day three biopsy is not such a common practice anymore. And for those who maybe have put embryology out of their mind, as a reminder, uh, most embryos are going to reach blastocyst stage at day five or day six of development. Um, although with um, culturing techniques improving in the IVF laboratory, um, some centers are able to culture embryos through day seven and some embryos will reach blastocyst stage on day seven. And so now, while most trophectoderm biopsies are still performed at day five or day six, it's not completely unusual to see samples that are submitted from day seven biopsies. So at the blastocyst stage, there's really two distinct parts to the embryo. There's an outer layer, an outer layer of cells, uh, which is called the um, trophectoderm. Those are the cells that go on to make primarily the placenta. And those are the cells that are removed in a trophectoderm biopsy. Makes sense what the name implies. There's also a cluster of cells um, called the inner cell mass. And those are the cells that go on um, to make the fetal structures. And those cells are not biopsied for PGT. Now, um, the expectation is that the genetic material that we, that we see in the trophectoderm is going to be representative of what's in the inner cell mass because everything starts from that same sperm and egg coming together. But we certainly know that that is not universally true. It is not true 100% of the time. 
uh, and probably the, the hottest topic in the PGT landscape right now is that of chromosome mosaicism as it relates to PGTA, which is just a, a good example of how the trophectoderm does not always represent the inner cell mass. Again, that's a separate webinar, uh, but I think the important takeaway point here is that um, we're biopsying trophectoderm with the expectation that it's representative, knowing that that is not true 100% of the time. But back to why we use linkage and why um, we have such a small amount of DNA, you have to remember embryos are very small. So uh, even a really good trophectoderm biopsy is going to have somewhere between five and seven cells. And that's really not enough DNA to do any sort of direct testing on. And so you need to, and so there needs to be DNA amplification. And while allele dropout is a real risk anytime you're doing any sort of genetic testing that requires amplification, when you're starting with a small amount of DNA, that risk is increased. And so that is why we utilize linkage testing. And, and there are you know, more, there's really more than one method that can be used to complete a linkage-based analysis. Um, probably the most common ones that are used currently um, are utilization of SNPs or of what we call STRs or short tandem repeats. But whatever markers your the laboratory is choosing to use for their linkage-based analysis, these are areas that are typically present within a defined region, both upstream and downstream of the gene of interest. And when we're testing biopsies, the presence or absence of these markers is going to assist in the diagnosis of those samples. And it is possible to do direct mutation analysis in some cases, not in every case, um, as we'll talk a little bit about in a few slides. Um, but th so there are certainly times where embryo biopsy evaluation includes direct mutation analysis, but not for every case. And if you have a linkage-based test established before you're testing biopsies, direct mutation analysis is typically not required. So I want to take a second to talk about um, this term that's used a lot in the PGT space, and I think not so well, uh, not so well known outside of the PGT space, and that is this, this concept of genetic phase or setting genetic phase. So genetic phase is really just a way of saying that the laboratory has determined which allele is the, is the affected allele and which allele is the wild type allele. And this is really sort of the crux of linkage testing. Uh, and in order to do this, you need to have a second generation. There have to be two generations to compare to each other to sort this out. And while each PGT case um, can certainly have different nuances, and they're certainly not all the same. In general, a good rule of thumb is that when you're trying to set genetic phase, you're looking to use a first degree relative or relatives um, in a different generation than the patient or patients. And ideally, you're looking to use someone who has the same genetic status as your patient. And this is really what allows those um, affected and unaffected alleles or haplotypes to be determined. So this illustration here is really a very simplified version of this um, because obviously I wasn't going to put a, a visual aid up here that had, you know, 50 informative uh, SNPs upstream and downstream of a gene of interest. That's too hard to follow. So I've simplified this. Uh, into a single letter that represents a haplotype. And I have an example here of using a generation below the reproductive couple and an example of using a generation above the reproductive couple. But I think what you see here is um, in the first example where we've got the trio, this is an autosomal dominant disorder. And this is a case where um, the couple has an affected child and we are able to determine um, by comparing the two um, parents to the affected child that the affected allele in this case um, is haplotype A, because we see that that's what the child in shares with her affected parent. Uh, B in the child is an unaffected haplotype inherited from the clinically unaffected second parent. The other example that you see here is a recessive disorder. In this case, um, this reproductive couple doesn't have a generation below them. This is someone who potentially has not had a pregnancy or has not had a child. This is certainly becoming more common in the age of expanded carrier screening where things are 
where things are um, being identified by screening rather than by the birth of an affected child or another affected family member. And in this scenario, we're going one generation above the reproductive couple and taking a look at parents and with confirmation of one carrier parent and one non carrier parent. We're able to discern that for the male patient haplotype C is the affected haplotype and for the female patient haplotype E is the affected haplotype and so we know an embryo biopsy with that AE combination is going to result in an, is going to result in an affected sample. And again, the single letter representations are really just for illustrative purposes. It's a little more complex in the lab, but I, I think this gets the point across. So just another, um, another, another visual aid to help. This is um, actually a schematic of how this works when we're testing embryo samples and how utilizing linkage protects against um, the effects of allele dropout. So in this scenario, we already have our genetic phase established that was done prior to samples being submitted for testing. Again, this happens to be a dominant disorder. So we can see that in this particular case, it's for the affected parent, the affected allele is designated as red and the wild type or unaffected allele is designated as blue and the unaffected, clinically unaffected parent um, has two blue alleles. And in our biopsy sample, um, if we're using direct mutation analysis only, that works really well. And it's gonna give us an accurate result if that, if that uh, mutation site amplifies. But if that mutation site does not amplify and you're only using sequencing, you're going to have sequencing data that appears to be wild type. Um, and so the thought is that that sample is unaffected, but in fact, the, the mutation site simply didn't amplify. So you've got, you've got an incorrect diagnosis. But if you look at the second two um, drawings to the, to the side of your screen, if we're utilizing linkage and along with direct mutation analysis, um, assessing for that linkage um, information, assessing for those haplotypes, you're not going to run into the same issue. So again, if you have an affected sample and your mutation site amplifies well, then you're going to have two data points that confirm an affected sample. You'll have your linkage information um, demonstrated here with haplotype A being the affected allele, and you'll have your mutation data. But if you happen to have a sample that's impacted by allele dropout, and so your sequencing data appears normal, but you can clearly see that your linkage data shows the affected haplotype has been inherited, you know that this is in fact not an unaffected sample. It is an affected sample that's been impacted by allele dropout. So you've still made your correct diagnosis. And that, that really is, again, why linkage is used. It's why it's the crux of what we're doing. It's to protect against that effect of allele dropout. So one of the questions that I get um, very commonly when I start to explain this process um, to patients, to physicians, to genetic counselors, really to anybody is, well, what happens if family members aren't around? And it's a very valid question because the reality is that not every family that wants to, to undergo PGT has family members available. And there are certainly a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes family members truly aren't available because they may be not, they may be unknown. They may be deceased or estranged, uh, but sometimes Patients just simply don't want to involve their family members. For some patients, this is a very private journey, and they would prefer not to share this part of their life um, un unless and until it is required or there is some good news to report. And then, of course, um, because I know I'm speaking to a genetics audience, we all know that there are certain conditions that have a pretty high de novo rate. And so the affected patient might have family members that are ready and willing to participate but they're really not appropriate references because the because there are, it's no one else affected in the family. And in most cases, PGTM is still gonna be available in these situations. Uh, it's still done by linkage analysis, but what we do is we utilize embryo biopsies as a second generation. And I've got some um, visual aids in the next couple of slides to help really demonstrate how that works. But the most important part of this approach is that this is, this is a time where being able to do direct mutation analysis on embryo biopsies is a requirement because the laboratory is going to rely on that direct mutation data 
to help set genetic phase. And as we'll talk about a little later, not every mutation type is amenable to this, which is another reason why a, a test might be available for a condition, but not necessarily for a certain family. So, but before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's just talk for a second about how we do this without family member references. So um, this again, just to make it easy, let's say that this is um, an autosomal dominant disorder. Let's say it's autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. We know that that condition has about a 10% de novo rate. So it's certainly not unusual for patients to come through and say, I have this disorder, but nobody else in my family does. I'm the first one. So what happens is, you know, after, you know, there's still work that's done in the laboratory. Um, a lot of it is done around being able to identify whatever the disease causing mutation is in the family in embryo biopsies. And you can also see here that the patient's haplotypes have been established, right? So again, just for simplicity, they're designated as one letter. Um, so we've got haplotype B and haplotype C in this affected patient. But at this point, we don't have a second generation. And so we don't know which haplotype is traveling with the mutation and which haplotype is traveling with the wild type allele. And in order to figure that out, we've got to have someone, we've got to have a second generation for comparison. And since we can't go, we can't go to parents, we go to embryo biopsies. So in this um, schematic, you can see that this patient has undergone an IVF cycle. There have been multiple embryo samples submitted for testing. And you can see here that the ones that are mutation positive are shaded in black. The ones that are mutation negative are not shaded. And you can also see the distribution of haplotypes. So we see a relatively equal number of samples that have inherited haplotype B and samples that have inherited haplotype C. And you can look at this and you can say, okay, well, this certainly looks like haplotype C is the affected haplotype because everything that is mutation positive is traveling with haplotype C and everything that's mutation negative with the exception of one sample is traveling with haplotype B. And because you've seen this mutation now in multiple samples, you can, you can conclude that haplotype, that the first sample of, that says haplotype C that has um, negative direct mutation testing is not actually unaffected, but is actually the result of the negative mutation testing is likely the result of allele dropout. But what happens if this patient doesn't have such a robust response to her IVF cycle and we have a much smaller number of biopsied samples submitted? And let's say the only thing the laboratory has for analysis are these first two samples. Well, these results really aren't helpful, right? We've got two samples, they have different haplotypes, but they are both mutation negative. There's really no way that the laboratory can set phase, remember that genetic phase we just talked about, and say which allele is the affected allele and which allele is the unaffected allele. So these results are inconclusive. And in order to, um, revise those results and provide a diagnosis, we would need additional biopsied samples. And so one of the biggest limitations of this approach when we're doing this without family members is that there needs to be a robust number of samples for testing and there needs to be a variety of diagnoses seen, meaning there has to be some embryos that test positive for the mutation that we're looking for, some samples that test negative. And, you know, while patients who submit high numbers of samples have a high likelihood of success, there really isn't a certain number that guarantees that. And so patients that are utilizing this approach have to understand that it is possible they will need to undergo one, more than one and sometimes more than two IVF cycles to produce enough samples to be able to provide these types of results. And that's why um, whenever possible, we are always encouraging patients to involve family members. Again, we know that for some cases, it's just simply not possible and that's okay. But when it is feasible, that is always what's encouraged. Okay, so just to take a second to talk a little bit about mutation type, because I've mentioned a couple of times 
um, that mutation type matters and we can find some mutations and biopsies and not others. And that's really important when we're thinking about um, whether we are in a situation where we need family members or we don't. So in general, um, when we're doing sequencing and embryo biopsy samples, um, the ability to identify very large deletions or duplications is quite limited. Um, and when I say large deletions or duplications, we're typically talking about um, whole exon or multi exon deletions or duplications. These are mutation types that we generally cannot sequence for which means testing is going to be linkage only, which means there's got to be a family member available to assist in the process. And while these types of mutations can be seen in any disorder, we've certainly seen neurofibromatosis results that are the results of deletion duplication. I had a BRCA result that was a multi-exonic duplication. Um, some of our repeat offenders are DMD, because of course, the, we know that about two thirds of those mutations are deletion or duplication and uh, Charcot-Marie tooth type 1A, the PMP22 duplication, also a common offender um, where cases might have to be declined based on the mutation type and family structure. The other request that comes in um, reasonably often is testing for chromosome microdeletions and microduplications, these types of copy number variants that are typically picked up on array. And these are sort of their own beast in and of themselves, uh, because most of them, maybe not most of them, but a fair number of them are de novo, um, either in a parent or in a child, which makes offering PGT typically not feasible. But in the cases where there is familial inheritance, uh, we still are going to need a second generation because these copy number variants, again, are often too large to sequence for directly in embryos. They're also too small typically for PGTA testing, which is why these, 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 uh, these findings are a little bit of their own, like I said, a little bit of their own beast. But there are also conditions that have complex results. So FSHD um, for hemophilia A, that intron 22 inversion, these are, these are conditions where, again, there's really not a way to get direct mutation analysis data from an embryo biopsy, so you're going to need a second generation. And then there are some conditions that have known pseudogene interference, and depending on where in the gene a particular mutation lives, even if it's a point mutation, it may not be something that we can sequence and readily identify in an embryo biopsy if there's pseudogene interference, which would again put us at a place where we are at a linkage-based only design. And if you've ever reached out to a laboratory asking, can you do PGTM for this, you're likely going to get a response that goes a little something like maybe, but please send us the genetic test reports. And this is exactly why, because like I said, mutation type really matters. Um, just to address a couple of other questions that come up reasonably frequently, um, people always ask me, is PGTM possible for? And again, listing uh, uh, several different things. So um, PGTM is possible to be done via exclusion testing. This is a pretty common request um, when we're talking about things like Huntington's disease. Uh, I just want to point out that it's typically not done via non-disclosure. And this is really a little bit of semantics because when a, a physician or a genetic counselor or a patient is reaching out, asking about non-disclosure testing. Typically what they really want is exclusion anyway, but just so that everyone is on the same page, non-disclosure testing means the laboratory knows the patient's status, the patient does not know their status. That, that's not a very common offering. Exclusion testing means the patient doesn't know their status, the laboratory doesn't know their status, we're simply excluding samples that have inherited the at-risk haplotype from the affected, usually it's the affected grandparent. Uh, PGTM may be possible for variants of uncertain significance. Different laboratories have different requirements about what needs to be submitted for documentation in these cases, but um, in some laboratories, it's not a blanket decline. Uh, we certainly can do PGTM for HLA matching in most cases. It's certainly possible to test for more than one condition. Um, we've certainly had cases come through for two, three, even four different um, Mendelian disorders. And it is possible to do PGTM for embryos that are conceived using gamete donors, provided that a DNA sample can be provided by the gamete donors. 
So that's our little primer on PGTM. I want to spend the rest of the time talking about cases, and I probably watch more TV than any three people need to do. Um, and I love the show New Amsterdam. That's my shameless plug. If you are looking for something to watch, it is on Hulu. You can totally binge it. Um, but this character, his name is Dr. Max Goodwin, and his famous phrase is, how can I help? So I thought he was very appropriate to put on um, to put on my transition slide. Also, this actor is Tom Eggold. And for those of you who like The Blacklist, he was um, the husband. I'm like Liz's husband. So how can clinical genetic counselors help um, their genetic counseling colleagues in a PGT lab? Or how can you help your um, IVF um, care providers who are reaching out to you for guidance on what to do next? Well, I'm gonna use cases to help demonstrate some of the most important points um, that I think we need to, to make sure that everyone really understands about the PGTM space. So starting with, and, and I will also say that these cases are not made up. I don't have to make anything up. And, um, and these, um, oh my gosh, if I can talk, um, that these, I, I will go through and, and talk about um, outcomes if I have them as well. So this is a patient who was referred in for PGTM for Fragile X syndrome, a very common PGTM referral. So upon reviewing um, her test results, she had a normal allele with 30 repeats and um, a premutation of 75 repeats. As you can see by my pedigree, um, the couple had not had a pregnancy. This was picked up via expanded carrier screening. Again, not unusual in this day and age. And they really wanted to do PGTM. And when I spoke to this couple, um, the female patient um, indicated that her parents were both alive. They knew that the couple was undergoing fertility treatment. They knew that she was a fragile X carrier, and she indicated that they were willing to help in any way possible. And so we talked about the importance of getting her um, parents tested, and um, she was very adamant that she was going to test her mom only because since this was an excellent condition, only her mom could be a carrier. She read that, she was told that, um, and I explained to her that while it's certainly possible her mom is a carrier, uh, males can certainly be premutation carriers as well, and that would be very important information to have. And if you wanted to expedite getting, you know, the lab started on PGTM test development, it might be beneficial to test both family members. But she didn't listen to me. And um, she went ahead and tested, her mom went ahead and got testing and she sent me her result. Uh, and her mom was also a carrier. Um, and you can see her expanded repeat is essentially the same as the patient's. But you can also see that her normal repeat is exactly the same. And this is what I like to call an uninformative parental result, um, which is sort of the bane of our existence in the PGT space and happens more often than we would really like because there's no way to discern um, if we just involve her mom, which allele this patient inherited from her mom. And so I told her, again, we really need to test your dad because that's gonna give us the information that we need to figure out what you have inherited from each parent. So they did actually go ahead and get her dad tested and you know they're in this talk for a reason. Not surprisingly, he also has a premutation. And so now with both parents tested, we can discern that this patient inherited her normal allele from her mom and her affected allele from her dad. And that information is utilized by the PGT lab to put together this linkage-based test for embryo samples. But this was um, nothing short of, this patient was nothing short of flabbergasted with this result um, and certainly required some additional counseling uh, and, and discussion about what this meant for her family members, including her dad. But the other thing is that this ended up delaying test start time by several weeks because her parents were tested serially rather than sequentially. And so my takeaway message here is that uh, it's really important to test all appropriate family members. And again, for me, the subtitle of this slide is, don't make assumptions. Somebody very wise, when I started in my PGT training uh, several years ago, said to me, we cannot and do not make assumptions in the PGT space because those types of assumptions 
lead potentially to genetic phase being set wrong, which could then potentially lead to incorrect biopsy results. And it's one of those things that has really stuck with me. Um, every time I talk to a patient, every time I'm looking at a case, every time I get a question, um, things that might have been taken for granted in a clinical space, not so much in a PGT space. So test all appropriate family members, ideally sequential, uh, serially, if, if, oh my gosh, I cannot talk. <laughs> simultaneously, that's the word I'm looking for, test them simultaneously if you can. All right, so moving on to the next case, this is a patient that got referred in um, for PGTM for cystic fibrosis, again, a very common referral indication. Um, on its surface, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, we received carrier screening reports for both uh, patient and her male partner. Again, both Delta F508 carriers picked up on expanded carrier screen. They had not had a child. Um, and so on its surface, this looks to be very straightforward. And I thought to myself when I was getting on the phone, this is going to be an easy case, like done and dusted. But then they told me that actually um, they, yes, they did not have a pregnancy, but the reason they didn't have a pregnancy is because they'd been experiencing infertility. And they had recently learned that the male patient had congenital absence of the vas deferens. And when I, when I was reviewing their results, I recognized that they were done at a lab that does not report on 5T status proactively. Um, 5T status is reported only as a reflex when certain mutations are identified. So I had a discussion with these patients about how this diagnosis of CAVD may change um, not only the genetic status, like the, the CFTR genetic status of the, patient, of the male patient, but potentially the recurrence risk they had been quoted, which was 25%. And um, the couple actually ultimately elected to do some additional testing. Um, the female patient in particular was quite savvy um, and asked, you know, well, wait a minute, could I have a 5T allele? Would that matter? And you know they're in this talk for a reason. So their follow-up testing um, identified that um, they both actually had um, Delta F508 and a 5T allele. They both happened to actually be 5T90. And the couple, again, had a very supportive family. We were able to get parental studies to confirm that for each of them, their um, Delta F508 and 5T alleles were in trans. And so this couple went from being told there was a 25% risk for a child with cystic fibrosis to essentially a 100% risk for a, a CFTR related disorder. Um, you know, a 25% risk for a Delta F508 homozygous finding, a 50% risk for Delta F508 5T, and a 25% risk for 5T 5T. And so in this particular case, we spent a lot of time talking about embryo prioritization um, and why they would not get a report um, for cystic fibrosis on an embryo sample that said unaffected. And that was a really important discussion to have with them, but it was also a really important discussion to have with their IVF center because IVF centers, not all, but some have policies in place that when PGTM results are received, affected embryos are automatically discarded. And in a situation like this, where you're not gonna get a report that says unaffected, that's really important for the center to know ahead of time. The other thing to know about this particular case is that this is a patient that had already completed an IVF cycle. Um, it was after their cycle was completed that their carrier screening results were returned. And so they had two samples um, that had um, normal PGTA results that ultimately actually both ended up being affected. Um, Delta F508 um, homozygous for one, the other one was Delta F508 and 5T, and the couple actually ultimately, and was male, um, and the couple actually ultimately uh, decided not to transfer either um, because the homozygous Delta F508 was not one um, that they would transfer at any point. And after some pretty lengthy discussion and um, really doing some searching about how the diagnosis of CAVD impacted this couple and this male patient, um, they decided that that wasn't for them. Um, and they actually um, moved on to donor sperm. But this couple had already incurred the cost of an IVF cycle um, and, and the cost of PGTM test development. Uh, before making that decision. So our takeaway message here is 
before patients um, are referred for PGTM test development, it's really important to make sure their genetic workup is complete. And if it's possible, and most people on this call are not going to have this sort of are not going to have this sort of authority, but if it's possible to make sure that genetic workup is complete before a couple embarks on an IVF cycle, because you may find yourself in a situation where a couple has undergone an IVF cycle that ends up having very, um, very little benefit for them. And that's time and money patients aren't getting back. So moving on to the next case, um, this is a patient who was referred in for um, testing for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, starting to see a theme here. This was picked up on expanded carrier screening. Um, she um, actually had a pregnancy that was identified to be affected by CBS, um, and that pregnancy was terminated. And at the time of our conversation, we talked about uh, potentially using DNA from that terminated pregnancy for the purposes of PGTM test design um, as our second generation, because we know looking at this finding, this is a large deletion. This is one where we must have a reference. We cannot do this without family members. Um, unfortunately, um, the CVS was done at a laboratory that did not keep sample for an extended period of time. And so the laboratory that did the Duchenne testing did not have DNA to provide. And the institution that the patient had her CVS at did not have backup DNA in their lab. So that was not an option. So we then explored with the patient getting her parents tested and I convinced her to test both of them simultaneously because DMD is one where we absolutely have um, cases where it's actually the father who carries the finding uh, because I think we're learning a lot more about the phenotypic spectrum of, of these deletions and duplications. But in this case, the, patient, um, the patient's parents were both negative. And so this was a situation where this was a case that had to be declined initially because this patient had, th this family had no second generation. And this couple ultimately decided to do IVF with PGTA um, for sex selection. The idea being that um, they would prefer preferentially transfer a female, um, do testing, and then utilize that uh, child or pregnancy as a second generation and do PGTM testing later on other samples. But as so often happens in cases like this, um, when they were done with their IVF cycle with PGTA, uh, they ended up with two euploid samples. They were both male. Uh, those samples were transferred. Um, a pregnancy resulted, um, again, affected, um, again, terminated. But this time, um, the patient put me in touch with her genetic counselor right away and we were able to get DNA from the affected pregnancy. And so we were able to put together a PGTM test, which has allowed this couple to go on um, to do additional IVF cycles with testing for Duchenne. Um, unfortunately, they've had sort of a, a bad run of not responding so well and not having great PGTA results, um, but um, they, they are still, they are, they are still um, persevering. So the takeaway message from this case is please talk to your patients about DNA banking. I, I understand that in the prenatal setting of getting an abnormal CVS or an amniocentesis result, it's not always the first thing that pops into our heads. Um, I remember very well being in the clinic and dealing with patients in these sort of crisis situations, but it is always better to have DNA and not need it than to need DNA and not have it. And DNA banking in this day and age is while I realize is maybe a financial strain for some patients or some couples is relatively inexpensive. Um, and so at least should be discussed, particularly if families want the option of PGTM later. And then our last case um, before we wrap up and, and I take some questions. Um, so this is a patient that was referred in for um, PGTM for OTC deficiency. And this one was one that was not picked up on, on uh, carrier screening. The way that this um, couple came to light is that they ended up having an affected son. And their affected son was diagnosed by newborn screening. He passed away at about 10 months of age. And at the time, um, there was no other testing done, um, just the uh, testing to confirm the female patient was a carrier. 
testing on the affected son. And when, we, and when they came to talk to me, that was the testing that was that we had. So again, I had a conversation with them about utilizing DNA from the deceased son. Um, and DNA was not available. Um, the genetic testing lab that did the OTC testing did not have samples stored for him. Um, it was discarded after a couple of months after the initial testing. And they lived in a state where the new birth blood spot cards um, are not kept for an extended period of time because that is one of the things that um, PGTM counselors are really good at is finding DNA in places that no one else would ever think to look. Um, and newborn blood spot cards are, are a, a source for us um, more often than you might think. But in this state, that was not an option. That, that card had been discarded. So we again um, decided to go up the family tree because although the couple did have another child, um, she was an unaffected female and they had been told previously by the genetics providers that were taking care of their son that testing for her was not indicated. So testing of her parents was done. Again, um, negative for both, not surprisingly for her dad, but given that we have had um, things that are surprising, uh, both parents were tested simultaneously, confirming that first of all, this mutation was de novo in the, in the female patient. And now we're in a situation where we either have to try to do this with no family members, or we have to try to get this minor child involved. And the additional background for this case that's really important is that this is a patient who had diminished ovarian reserve. She was not, per, she was not um, considered of advanced maternal age. She was actually on the younger side, um, but nonetheless on uh, fertility workup was identified um, to have diminished ovarian reserve and was expected to have a small number of embryos for biopsy, which is not ideal if you're not using family member references. And so I had a conversation with a couple about involving their daughter in this process, which they were very open to. Um, but they, again, they had been previously told that testing her was not, was, was not possible. So I actually reached out to the genetic counselor that the family had been working with primarily for their affected son, um, but they had seen the daughter and explained the situation um, and, and essentially said, you know, for this family, if they want the option of testing embryo samples um, and doing that potentially with just, with just a cycle, and we really need a second generation and this child is really the only person available. And after that discussion, um, the genetic counselor took the case to the MD who agreed to order the testing and the child is a carrier, but we were able to put a PGTM test together for them with family member references, which meant when this couple cycled and um, had a very small number of biopsies submitted, those samples were able to have results generated for them. I actually don't have follow up on this case. Um, I know they had a couple of cycles that yielded unaffected samples, but I, I never did get any sort of pregnancy follow up. So I hope that they were successful. Um, but my takeaway message from this case is you might be asked to test a minor. And while I understand that that um, raises some alarm bells for some genetic counselors, I would just implore you to really hear out why that request is being made, because for some families, it's the difference between being able to test embryos and not. So I know we're about at about time for questions, so I'm going to um, wrap up here. The last couple things that I just wanted to point out, how, how is it that genetic counselors can help families that are in this situation? Um, I would um, just ask you to please help set patient expectations. It's something that we do in the PGT lab every time we talk to a patient, but the more repetition, the better. But I think the takeaway message um, from here is that no couple is ever guaranteed that they're going to have an unaffected sample or an unaffected embryo for transfer at the end of any given IVF cycle. And for some couples, more than one IVF cycle is needed to find an embryo that is unaffected by the single gene disorder and has a euploid PGTA result. Um, and that is sometimes very hard for patients to hear. Uh, but I think it's always better to know going in that you might get a result that you're not going to love. Um, and I would also just take a second to point out that um, most patients who are undergoing PGTM are adding PGTA. And even for the youngest patients, the risk of aneuploidy is around 40%. 
which means if you're looking for an autosomal recessive disease, the risk for aneuploidy is actually higher than the risk for the single gene disorder, which is also really important information for patients to have. Um, and sort of hand in hand with that is talking about the likelihood of a successful pregnancy because we know that embryos that are unaffected and have euploid PGTA results don't always guarantee pregnancy. Um, and that sometimes couples who don't have any identified fertility issues still may not have a great outcome after an IVF cycle. And just continuing to reinforce for, our, for families that this is a journey, um, that it may take some time to get to their ultimate destination is always much appreciated. Again, that's something we do in the PGT lab, but the more reinforcement we have, the better. So I'm going to finish up by just saying it's really important that you know the lab your patient is working with. There are uh, multiple PGT labs in the United States, and it's really important to know what turnaround time is for this test development, how the accuracies are that are being quoted, what the documentation requirements are for any given case, how results are going to be reported, are they going to be reported as affected or unaffected, at risk or not at risk, increased risk, decreased risk. Um, to be able to work with the PGT lab to figure out if there's a disease or a family structure that is going to result in a decline of a case. And um, as always, PGTM is never a replacement for confirmation testing. Ideally, con uh, confirmation ha testing happens during pregnancy, but that's really at the patient's discretion. It can also happen postnatally. And that's it. And I'm only one minute over my 50 minute allotment, which is excellent. And so now, if it's okay, I'm actually going to, well, I'll leave my, I'll leave my screen on but I need to pull up so I can see, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Sheila. That was a great summary. We, we definitely do have some questions coming in. Um, there, were, there were a few um, audience members who are interested in, maybe if you'd be able to expand on PGTM for X-linked disorders. Sure. So, um, in general, PGTM for X-linked disorders is available. So I guess I'm not quite sure. I'll just give a little overview. Um, and then if I don't I think the question- more like with, with linkage for X-linked disorders and how that sort of works. Yep, so it's, it's, it's really the same process because once we know what the gene of interest is, so you know, Fragile X is a great example, um, the laboratory still utilizes um, those markers, whatever they might be in a given laboratory, whether they're SNPs or STRs that flank the, the X-linked gene um, that determines which haplotype is the affected one, which haplotype is the unaffected one. Um, I will say that in general, PGTM for X-linked disorders is offered when the female gamete contributor is a carrier or affected. It's generally not um, done if the male patient is affected because males only have one X chromosome. So there's only one haplotype and you can determine the status of embryos based on sex. So we do occasionally get requests for PGTM for X-linked disorders. You know, this male patient has hemophilia or this male patient has um, Kennedy's disease. And um, that those cases are typically not accepted they, um, you know, the clinic is, is um, given a response that, you know, because this is a genetic male who's affected, uh, sex of embryos is going to determine status. I don't know if that's maybe quite what we were getting at. Um, but the same, you know, otherwise we need a second generation. Um, we need confirmation of genetic status that it's not different in that sense between a uh, dominant or a recessive disorder. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, there's one comment, uh, not so much a question, uh, from someone who is noting that with regard to testing for things like Huntington disease, there are some PGT labs that use non-disclosure and not exclusion as their default. That's just one comment. Um, one other question was uh, sort of if you'd be able to expand on PGTM for de novo mutations in a patient and is PGTM available for couples who have a child that has a de novo mutation if there's a concern for germline mosaicism? It's a great, great question. So I think I'm gonna answer the second one first. And actually, hmm, I don't, I didn't put my visual aid in the slide. Okay, so the short answer is that um, when a couple has a child with a de novo condition, we are typically not offering PGTM in that case. 
And the reason is because there's not, if you have a child who has a de novo condition and both parents are known to be unaffected, so not that one is mosaic, um, but that they both have had testing for whatever the condition is and they are negative, uh, there's, there's really not a way to accurately identify which parental haplotype that mutation came from. And so if you were to do something like that, you're going to end up excluding 75% of embryos for transfer, when in fact, that's almost certainly not the recurrence risk. And so again, this is gonna be a little bit, I should actually back up and say, this is gonna be a little bit different between labs. In general, it's not, it's not often offered. Um, it might be a laboratory specific decision, um, but it's not unusual for requests for PGTM for a child with a de novo disorder to be declined. Because again, there's really not a way to definitively identify what is that affected haplotype. And so that leads to the exclusion of a lot of embryos that are probably unaffected. That's sort of the shorter answer. The, the second part to that is that if a family has demonstrated that there is germline mosaicism, because we do get requests for that, where patient has an affected pregnancy, they were told this is de novo, it's a very low risk of recurrence, and then they have a second affected pregnancy. That actually is something that we can typically offer PGTM for. Uh, now, again, those cases can be nuanced, and so it's not a blanket acceptance, but um, PGTM for a family that has demonstrated germline mosaicism is, is, is possible. Great, thanks. There's a few questions coming in about the, the cost of PGTM and sort of the landscape of insurance coverage. Okay, so I'm gonna defer the cost question because that is very specific to the laboratory that's being used. Um, but I can talk a little bit about insurance coverage in that it really is all over the place. Um, and I think, you know, we really can't talk about insurance coverage for PGT without talking about insurance coverage for IVF. So um, the, the Cliff Notes version of this is that um, IVF coverage is not universal and nor is uh, PGT coverage. It's very much policy dependent. And so patients are always encouraged to work with their insurance company to determine if PGTM and or PGTA is a covered benefit. And if it is, um, then there's a different discussion about in-network versus out-of-network and, and those, those kinds of things. Uh, most IVF centers have a financial coordinator that can help, and most PGT labs have um, client services and in individuals or coordinators um, who can help with the billing part. But I, I suspect the question was asked more about um, as it relates to access, because this, this is not an inexpensive undertaking and the cost itself makes this prohibitive for some families. And, and we are well aware of, we, we are well aware of that. Um, I, I think advocacy for access, again, could be a whole nother webinar. So there's only a couple minutes left, but maybe just quickly. Um, there are some questions about the accuracy of PGTM and the residual risk to a child or pregnancy and how often we might get discordant results if there is diagnostic testing done either prenatally or postnatal. Post yeah, great question. So again, I'm going to defer um, PGT accuracies to the lab that's being utilized. Um, you may not get the same accuracy quoted um, from between lab A and lab B. Um, in general, discrepancies are uncommon. Again, I, I would say you would probably need to follow up with the PGT lab your patient is working with. But as you can imagine, in general, um, the labs are getting outcome information um, most often when there is a discordant result. And that happens very, very rarely. Um, and the one thing that I would say is that there are certainly, there's certainly more than one explanation for a discordant result, um, including things like spontaneous pregnancy um, and um, potentially um, an incorrect embryo being transferred. And that doesn't necessarily mean an embryo that doesn't belong biologically to that couple, but perhaps there are multiple embryos in the cohort 
um, and 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 uh, and an embryo that um, does not have the result we were thinking uh, was transferred. Those are very very rare. So for those who are listening who are in the IVF space, please do not think that we are telling patients that there is a high risk for something like an em like an embryo mix up. That is absolutely not happening. Um, but I think when patients are asking about accuracies, there are more, there's more than one reason to, to talk about confirmation of PGTM results. Thanks. I think um, that's probably all the time we've got. Yeah, we're running right on the hour. So thank you so much to Sheila and to Mira for such an informative presentation. Speaking for myself, I learned so much today. This does conclude today's member webinar. On behalf of the NSGC webinar subcommittee, I wanted to thank all of you for attending this webinar and a huge thank you to our speakers for sharing their stories and experiences. The webinar recording will be posted to the webinar page of the NSGC website within 48 hours. Have a great day. <laughs>